All right, so welcome back into the live stream today. We're gonna to be talking about crypto onboarding. What are some of the strategic moves that are happening in the space that could affect not only your bank account, maybe your trading and equities accounts and crypto all at one time. We'll dive in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to into TechPath. We're going to jump in today to this is a, a, a topic really that talks about what I think is one of the critical elements of Bitcoin and crypto adoption, and that is onboarding for people who had never got into crypto. Because remember, you watching our show, maybe for the first time, you've already done your homework on cryptocurrency. Maybe you've already done your homework on altcoins and Bitcoin. You've learned about XRP and you're already there. But there is a lot of people in their financial investment futures that are looking at crypto maybe for the first time and just giving it a little bit more of a thought, especially right now since the markets are way down and there will be some great potential buys. The key here is what kind of moves are being made out there in the marketplace that could play into easy on-ramping, ways to be able to really maybe secure your crypto in custody style accounts within bank accounts and other aspects. We'll dive into all that and some of the, the projects and companies that are behind this. So I want to jump to this first story. This is Plaid. Now, if you, you've heard me talk about Plaid, if you've watched our show very long, you kind of know my stance on Plaid and that is not a good one. Uh, but at the same time, it is a product that is being used to essentially bridge the, the entire financial community. And what I mean by that is when you plug in your bank account to almost any other external source that does not require an ACH verification, you've probably seen them. There's those little two cent and 27 cent deposits that you have to match up. That's called an ACH verification. And or you're transferring maybe via wire uh, or you're doing some sort of bank wire transfer or bank check. All those kind of solutions are very manual. They're very um, lethargic. They just don't really work in today's instantaneous environment of being able to move money, cash, and in this particular case, crypto. So what Plaid did a few years ago, uh, it's about six, seven years ago, they really started going all in on connecting all the banks with being able to essentially tie into any service that they would provide services to, to your bank account almost seamlessly. In essence, you click one button, your bank account and that service is connected. And here's the interesting thing about Plaid, it's a read-write solution, meaning it can write to your bank account as well as read from your bank account. So it's a two-way uh, function. So Plaid's new privacy controls let you manage your financial data from a single hub, this is going to be this element called the Wonder Wallet. Uh, we'll go into a little bit about this. One thing I want to uh, kind of highlight right here is this area right here. 5,500 apps that connect to bank accounts has been accused of taking too much financial information. This is the thing I don't like uh, from users and then using that information to access and sell their transaction history. This is a big concern. They actually uh, lost a lawsuit about this. But this is one of the big things that Plaid is and has been known for. Now, could they be getting on the right track about really providing great services to consumers? We'll see. But the real, uh, I think the real factor here is how is all of this going to be connected into the potential of cryptocurrency? So here you go. Plaid, this is a good example. Plaid to pay $58 million to consumers using Venmo, Robinhood, and other apps after collecting too much data. This, was, of course, was a lawsuit that Plaid uh, essentially lost and they went to a settlement right here. So paying 58 million. Small price to pay considering the amount of data and the amount of transactions that go through Plaid. Pretty significant overall. So the proposed financial data privacy bill is a scenario that's supposed to start protecting us. Now this is important because I feel like we are in a very interesting state right now. And what I mean by that is banks, obviously your trading accounts, what you're seeing here on your exchange accounts from the crypto side, all of these are starting to vie for the same style of information. And that information essentially are your trading habits, your investment processes, all of your strategies, as well as all your banking and financial information. All of that is really what is at risk right now. So the proposed financial data privacy bill is going to tighten up consumer data sharing rules. I think this will be a good thing. The question will be, who kind of skirts around this? Now, the, Hans, uh, the House Financial Services Committee ranking member Patrick McHenry 
McHenry. We actually had uh, one of the guys on from the crypto um, association, from blockchain association, that talked about uh, McHenry and his movement in this space around data and privacy because cryptocurrency and most likely the integration of real world banks are going to be a big, big question mark, especially because crypto has been somewhat anonymous, at least from a sense of, you know, being able to move around within the blockchain. Uh, obviously, KYC and AML rules and regulations here in the United States change that. But for you, you guys globally, it's a little different play out than what we're dealing with here in the United States. Obviously, Plaid is being used worldwide. So I want to get into the further uh, com uh, component here of what Plaid released. This is a, uh, a PDF, and I want to jump into a couple of points they made right here. And this is keeping Web3. This is from Plaid. This is a, a report that they did talking about their new solutions and how all this integration might work. But from self-custody wallets to central exchanges, crypto's varied consumer services present a range of security and safety challenges. If you watched our live stream this morning, and I was uh, talking about this with Full Value Dan, is what, what is one of the biggest challenges we face as an industry, as the crypto community? And his point was, I think, was dead on, and that is security. Security is the number one issue with what's happening in the wake of Celsius, Voyager, and many others, Terra, obviously what happened with Luna. And there are so many others that are brewing right now. We just don't know about them yet. Security is one of the biggest things. So they kind of leverage in on your, your concern of security. And if you go back to this report, kind of go in here a little bit further, uh, it says, as a broader range of consumers enter the system, this means the new, the new people, uh, the winners will be those who can maintain the permissionless ethos in crypto while assuring consumers of safety and security as they move across platforms. Now, what this means to me is that Plaid has a solution in place that is going to start to create a two-way passage point between the exchanges, FTX, Coinbase, you name your exchange, Binance US, whatever you use, and your bank accounts or your trading accounts. And we'll get into further about what they're talking about on doing this. I wanna to jump to the last portion of the page here. Let me kind of zoom out a minute. And it says right here, conclusion is bridging finances present and future. Now. There's a few things here that I want to zoom in on right here. One is called data portability, which is going to reinforce, reinforce the best of crypto's promise. Now, this is really the value proposition that crypto has always delivered, is that it is and can be a value transaction between you and I without the need of a third party. So data portability can reinforce the best of the promise here. At heart, crypto's vision in a world of consumers can easily adopt services from anywhere, same vision applies, so they say. Consumers should have identical rights to their crypto as their fiat data, meaning now we're, gonna, we're talking about bank integration. Crypto has become the meaningful part of consumers' financial lives, essential to financial planning and literacy. And then you've got consumers deserve protections across their financial lives. Now, all of this sounds good to me because I am worried about security and I am especially worried about how banks and also exchanges are going to play nice in the future. Because as we start to get into a scenario, and this also stands for the trading houses, as we get into the future, we are going to be dealing with less and less liquidity. And I probably should do a video on why I think the global liquidity is in dire straits right now, why it could have a big effect on how crypto flows out over the next few years. But the reason that this becomes very important is because if liquidity can start to mix and mingle, between the dollar and Bitcoin, and also be able to withstand the pressures of you know, economic pressures, monetary, fiscal, all those kind of things. What it simply means is you're gonna be able to use your crypto within your bank, your bank directly into your crypto and your trading exchange. I anticipate in some point, we'll start to see the emergence of all those factors come to one place. And this is something we've talked about before I was on actually with, with James uh, yesterday on our live stream from Invest Answers, which by the way, guys, we're going to be on a live stream with uh, James on his uh, DCA uh, show. So make sure and stay tuned. I think he's going to be uh, streaming at around 2.30 Eastern. So check it out. Uh, I'll be over there. I'm going to be talking about some of these things. But my point here is that there is an opportunity here to bring in the masses in a way that would create more liquidity in the marketplace. Because remember, right now we have it all in pots. You got a big pot of crypto over here. You got your fiat over here. You got your trading and exchange accounts over here. Imagine if all of that starts to mingle together. Liquidity would start to be much more fluid. 
We'd also have the ability of in and out uh, in security challenged issues. The big challenge, of course, will be uh, exchanges and how they manage that in and out transaction. Because right now, that's a big part of it. It's exactly how what, and what happened with both Celsius and Voyager in terms of blocking withdrawals. So be thinking about how all this plays in. Now, I think Plaid is one of those companies that could do it. Leading digital asset exchanges join the Plaid network. Let me kind of break down what's happening right here. So people want to share their crypto data alongside traditional holdings. So that's that's cool. Binance, Gemini, Robinhood, SoFi are now supported on the Plaid network. Support for additional platforms coming to blockchain.com and BitGo. So there's your international component right there. Many crypto investors acquire and hold their digital assets and accounts separate. Back to my point of you have these pots. And then through Plaid, they can now securely share their crypto account information and it's going to go across asset types. So I think this is very, very interesting. Now, there are some benefits to this because it could get in to helping you with doing your taxes because let's say you have many of these different tax companies out there right now that essentially are having to plug in through API or downloading these big PDFs and then ingesting that into their platform so you can get tax reporting services for your crypto. But this is going to be cool because it's going to get into net worth uh, calculations and other potential use cases. This is the big uh, statement right here. Other potential use cases. That to me is and tells me that we're going to start to see some very interesting applications uses within this. They are talking about brokerage and retirement accounts, 529s, health savings accounts, all of that being part of this as well. So it's a little scary, but at the same time, I feel like the general person that is going to be coming into crypto, and I'm not talking about, you know, minnows and, you know, tiny whales and things of that. Nature. I'm talking about people that have never been in crypto before. They're going to want those security elements. And this could be one of the gateways. As I said, in the past, it's always been about onboarding. Now I think it's about onboarding and security. And I think that's where Plaid comes in. So Plaid provides the most comprehensive financial data network connecting this 12,000 financial institutions. This is going to grow fast. Uh, including fintech apps uh, across North America and Europe, allowing people to securely connect financial info. So cool. Plaid's also bring crypto closer to mainstream and digital finance. This, I think, is the real, really uh, killer app because it will start to integrate in with our identity verification, which is all of the compliance around K- KYC and anti-money laundering. So again, good for the average person those who like privacy will probably look at this as a, you know a, a cross trying to defend off a vampire i think there, there's two different looks at how this may play out so it's going to be uh, one to watch for sure just remember that visa and plaid abandoned a merger this was back here in 2021 we actually reported on this and and this was another thing that uh it was an antitrust scenario where Visa was trying to acquire Plaid, and that's where you're getting on both sides of it because now you're getting in not only into the financial side of it where you're holding your cash, but also to the credit side of it where you owe your cash. So debit and uh, and actual uh, overall funds started to mingle, and that's why I think the antitrust came through, through and, and pretty much blocked that. Crypto payments gain ground thanks to centralized payment processors. Again, this will be another scenario that will help. MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, let me kind of zoom in on that just a little bit there. Uh, And several others, they've they've started to pave the way. I've actually started using more and more crypto and payments uh, around the use of things like PayPal and even certain Visa and MasterCard merchant services are making that available as well as a lot of different uh, products out there that are web integrated merchant services that we'll see more of. Again, this will all play into standardizing and normalizing everyday use of crypto, whether you're using Ethereum or BNB or whatever kind of token, maybe even Bitcoin uh, or an altcoin, you know, in terms of payments. So I think this is all good in the sense of overall adoption. This report right here, crypto adoption on the way to mainstream, says the checkout.com report. And they, they talk a little bit here about some of the things that you and I have already talked about a lot of these things. We kind of know this is coming. You guys are drinking the Kool-Aid. You're way ahead of the crowd. Remember, you're very early. If you're watching our channel right now in 2022, you are way early in crypto and the adoption of blockchain technology and what this means for the future. So it's rapidly gaining appeal among younger demographics. 40% of the 18 to 35-year-old consumers are wanting to plan to use crypto for paying for goods and services. So that's big. Online businesses say 
Only 23% say they're planning to do it. I think that's going to really accelerate in a very short period of time. Also, crypto is already having a material impact on merchants in the overall with more than two and a half billion worth of payments. So that's another big advantage thing. Visa sees this coming, hence why you see Visa-backed crypto cards. Almost 70% of merchants also surveyed uh, believe that uh, speed of which crypto payments can be made and settled is a potential re revolutionize the business models. This is something we talked about with Tyler over at AMP, all that kind of stuff. There are some things happening here with AMP I want to show you guys on that, so we won't miss that. Uh, on to more stuff here. I want to kind of jump on to this one, and this is uh, a Reddit piece. Gemini Pay is being dropped from the AMP platform. Now, we had AMP on just here recently uh, talking about, I should say Flexa, talking about the integration of Gemini Pay. Now, there's potentially two ways to look at this. Uh, our Crypto Pit team kind of looked at some potential opportunities here. It could be a bad thing if Gemini is pulling off of it, is AMP and the network just not high quality enough? Could be. Or it could be something else, and that is maybe AMP has come up with a solution that you no longer need to jump through these little hoops of opening your Gemini app, going to select the retailer, paying. Maybe there's something else that's coming that is AMP ambiguous, so or app ambiguous, meaning we'd be able to, to essentially do this with one app being the AMP application to be able to do payment, maybe across a lot of different blockchains and things of that nature. So I'm going to be really uh, interesting. Just because Gemini Pay will be gone doesn't mean, and this came from Tyler, this was a tweet, doesn't mean you can't use Gemini to pay. So... Very cool stuff there. All right, so let me get into um, one other thing here because I, I want to jump into uh, something with the SEC as well. The SEC is wa uh, waiving some rules to regulate crypto, and this is basically a situation, and this is very odd because with what Gary Gensler has been talking about and really pressuring what's been happening with Ripple and the case against XRP, this kind of sidesteps all of this saying, and this is Gensler basically saying that they're considering that there might be some cryptos that would be excluded. Let me kind of go to the quote here. Gensler repeated a warning that many crypto companies are not compliant without naming any. Such, uh, will be, such of these will be deemed offering unregistered securities. Now, this is not bad overall because securities, you know, some projects won't be able to meet the compliance requirements to be able to continue to operate, they'll go away. But there will be a lot of these projects that you see in the top 50, top 100 tokens. They're going to have no problems being able to meet the requirements uh, for that. So don't worry about that. But there is a potential path forward, Gensler said. I've said to the industry and to the lending platforms, uh, to the come in and talk to us. However, he also said that the SEC hasn't provided a clear path for companies to register. That is the problem and has been the problem all along with XRP. So he is kind of talking about, you know, kind of both sides of his mouth of saying maybe there's some that would be sidestepped here and uh, maybe there's some that would fall under the SEC guidelines. Again, this will make a big difference in how not only exchanges deal with this, but remember, banks who already offer trading services, whether you think about your, you know, your investment services through Chase or Ally or many of those others, that are offering platforms that compete up with things like Robinhood and that. I'm telling you, the banking system is starting to merge together with securities and eventually we'll see this with crypto. Plaid will be a very integral part of how all this starts to connect. I do want to thank our sponsors for today and that is iTrust Capital. If you guys are looking at long-term, and I hope you are, long-term crypto holdings, there's only really one way to do it, and that is through a crypto IRA. It's easy. The, the idea behind crypto IRAs are pretty simple too. Remember, bear and bull markets, not necessarily that big of a deal to you because you're on a much longer time horizon. And of course, with iTrust, these guys are one of the best in the business at $5.5 billion in transaction, 175,000 accounts created. What I ask for you to do, because I know everybody's worried about security and things of that nature, is we don't vouch for our advertisers, but when we look at the advertisers, we do vet them out the best we can. And what I would do is jump into their program, just give your email, learn about what they offer, and then take small steps and start making decisions on how you want to manage IRAs. You can convert some IRAs in there. They give you a full guide of how to do that. But all you have to do is click the link below, 
you'll get a hundred dollar funding reward to jump in on that. I want to go back to uh, a tweet here with uh, Representative uh, Emmer. He's been on our show before talking kind of to this very point. History will remember Gary Gensler's regime at the SEC as a bad faith watchdog whose regulatory inconsistency jeopardized public trust and weakened our financial markets. And I think that's the problem that, uh, that he has really kind of put himself in overall. Now, this was that statement that I was talking about. Even tailoring what the disclosures might be because maybe not all of the disclosures for somebody issuing equity are the same as a crypto token. But I would not note we don't have the same disclosures for asset-backed securities that we do for a stock offering. So it's a thoughtful way to sort out uh, the aspect of being able to identify some altcoins that would be securities and some altcoins that may not. So it's going to get really sticky. And and unfortunately, it's going to be tough to really understand. So I think the exchanges are going to be put under some pressure here uh, to really kind of help this go. Don't forget to put some questions in over on the sidebar. Uh, and we will definitely talk uh, with that. And of course, we'll try to get at some of the questions. Don't forget also we're doing our live stream with uh, James over at Invest Answers at 2.30. Let's jump over to this story right here. California regulator probes crypto lenders over their withdrawal suspensions. This, of course, is the issue around Uh, What's happening with, of course, none other than Voyager and Celsius, and we may see a lot more regulations coming in from the state level. This may get really dirty fast, and I'm just very curious as to how this might play out. If you look at what California is doing, uh, the Financial Protection Unit, DFPI, which looks into the operations of state and licensed financial institutions, are investigating uh, whether crypto asset companies that suspended withdrawals and transfers have broken the law. This, of course, is including Voyager and uh, Celsius, of course. They also said in the past that crypto interest account providers aren't government governed by the same rules and protections as banks and credit unions. So a lot of people look at this as how do they even fall into the guidance of being ruled by something like a DFPI. So that'll be, I think, going to be play out for quite some years. And again, this gets back to my point I've said all along is that what's happening in DeFi, decentralized, you know, blockchain and what crypto has brought to the financial architecture of society has pushed us into a place where, much like the internet did, it pushes us into a place where regulators, lawmakers are so far behind, states are even further behind, and we're just going to see a lot of catch up right now. So you just have to be ready for a little bit over, I think, over-regulatory and maybe heavy-handedness over the next few years Just be ready for that because I do think some of that's going to play in. Crypto regulation, central banks get to global draft rules at G20 meeting. And this is what I'm talking about. When you look at G20 and what this means, these are all the finance ministers and the central bank governors. Uh, This was in October on regulatory and supervisory supervisory approaches to stable coins and other assets. Uh, All of that was in uh, the report. And of course, a failure of a market player in addition to imposing potential large losses on investors and threatening market confidence. Hence, Luna, UST, uh, all of this is what's causing this kind of pressure coming in from a global uh, perspective. And I think that's the difference around what's happening in crypto is it is happening from a global stage right now. So we're seeing a lot more of it. All right. So don't uh, don't get all your questions in there at once there, guys. Uh, Patrick Hansen, we've had him on the show. Unlike U.S. banks, European banks have never recovered from the financial crisis in 2008. Europe is in need of financial innovation and should embrace crypto with open arms. I am somewhat bullish on crypto being more advanced in Europe than in the U.S. here on the short time, because I feel like with what Mika has done and what eventually we'll see because of pressures, both from a monetary and fiscal standpoint in Europe uh, versus what we've seen uh, just in terms of you know, what they're dealing with on a inflationary standpoint, we could see crypto slide in there in a very unique and different way, which could really open up some interesting aspects for for Europe. And, you know, when you talk about uh, Europe, you can't, of course, miss out on what Putin is saying, signs a bill banning digital assets as payments into law. Again, this goes back into the ability to control the money, because if you control the money, you control the people. This is exactly the playbook that's coming out of China. 
And this is something that I am concerned with because obviously this can't happen in India. This could happen in places like Turkey and others that kind of really uh, follow the guidance of what is happening in the East, especially around China and also with what's happening here uh, with Russia as well. All right, we're going to get to some questions. I think we might uh, try to get to some of those and we'll get rolling. Um, I do want to say one thing, guys. If you are not subscribed to our Diamond Circle, let's get in there because this is one of the key things that we do uh, to get you guys going. And you know what? We've got a live stream coming up, so I'm probably not going to take any questions, but I will send up a poll real quick. Let's do the poll real quick and we'll talk about Diamond Circle. So are you concerned about giving Plaid access to your crypto and banking data? It sounds like all of you are. Yeah, you want to protect your privacy. Good for you guys. I mean, because this is something, it will make tax reporting easy. That's for sure. Um, but it is something, but you should be able to do that. If you're an advanced crypto user, that's kind of an easier thing unless you're doing something in bot trading and stuff like that. But one thing I do want to remind you guys of is get in on our diamond circle. We've been dropping some amazing stuff in there via our email. I also, it's also a place where you can get into some of our other things like the crypto power index. We do have the mastermind group out there as well. It's very limited. We're only taking a handful of users each month. Uh, but it is a direct communication to myself and our team. And it we drop a lot of our research there. I drop a lot of our insights. And it's almost daily. We also drop um, sentiment over the weekends and on off days. Remember, sentiment only drops on the power index on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in our traditional uh, do-it-yourself kind of product. But within the, uh, the Mastermind, we, we go a lot more heavy on that, especially around Bitcoin and Ethereum. All right, guys, we're going to get loose on this one. Uh, Make sure and hit me out on Twitter. It's at Paul Barron. I'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.